and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. And we are here for our second Pride Month episode. And before we get like super deep into it, actually the author of the book that we're reading today, Alexis Hall, tweeted something recently. And I've seen this in many variations going around um, during Pride Month. And I think it is a great reminder, which is just, I, I believe that he said something to the effect of a reminder that my books exist on the other 11 months of the year as well. Mm-hmm. Like that LG, or he said LGBTQ plus books exist, not just in June. And so I think that we want to celebrate Pride Month because there's a lot of great reasons to continue to increase visibility for this community. But I also want to say, like, we do try our best to not just have, you know, LGBTQ books during June. Um, We try to have them throughout the year. Hopefully you guys know that. But also, like, hopefully you guys are reading queer books throughout the whole year because there's so many great ones that are out already so far this year, coming out this year. And we want to see more of them, especially in historical romance. Absolutely. And I think that's a perfect segue into the fact that this is a newer author for us, but he has a bunch of books already published. And he does write in that LGBTQ sphere. And he is the author of Boyfriend Material. There's a sequel, Husband Material, coming out, which are um, contemporaries. He also has a bunch of like like investigative books that look really interesting that I want to read. And there's some like fantasy type novels as well. So overall, I've been just going through his book, his bookology. <laughs> Is that the word? Bibli- no, bibliography? No, whatever. The bookography. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I was I was like, I kind of want to read that one. I kind of want to read that one. Ooh, that looks interesting. So there's definitely a lot of uh, books there to spark your interest if you um, like this summary. And they're not all historical. They're contemporary, like I said, contemporary fantasy. Some are not even officially romances. They're just novels um, with interesting what? heroines. and Read a non-romance novel? I know, Kelsey. right? <laughs> well, okay, they're <laughs> mysteries. So, like, honestly, like, if I'm going to read a non-romance, it's going to be, like, a mystery or fantasy. Like, those are my yeah. two other yeah. genres besides. <laughs> but overall, just, like, a lot of great works. And, you know, I think that we just want to, in June, really highlight this because it is becoming such a more diversified, even within its own subgenre. And I think that taking time during Pride to highlight a bunch of these books, especially newer ones that are coming out, um, that way the rest of the year you can refer back and read some amazing books by some amazing people. Yeah. And as people who live in America know, gay rights and trans rights and women's rights are all kind of under threat right now or attack. And so um, Pride Month is really important and I'm really glad we're celebrating. Me too. So the book we're reading today, which we've talked a lot around it, but let's actually (laughs) talk about it. Yes. So it's A Lady for a Duke by Alexis Hall. And since this is our first book by this author, we're going to have some author facts. And the other really exciting thing is this is our first male author. I know. This is really exciting. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of silly because, again, like, you know, we want to amplify, um, you know, women's voices in general. I, I think, like, you know, uh, authors skew male and, 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 and authors who get attention or get paid more, et cetera, et cetera, often are male. But in within the romance genre, that's not necessarily the case. And so I think it's really cool to just hear different voices all the time, um, and all sorts of different perspectives. And I'm just really happy that we get to review his book. Absolutely. Me too. So um, we have a brief author fact, and then we're going to get into a fun history fact, and then we will get into our book per usual. So Alexis Hall does not like writing biographies or talking about himself in the third person. He lives in Southeast England with his extensive collection of hats and three angry duck children. There you go. 
I desperately want to know more about the duck children. I know, though. me too. Like, <laughs> actual ducks because, oh my God. I mean, I have chickens. I love my chickens. But my husband and I like joke about getting ducks and like we can't because we have a pool and so the ducks would just be in the pool um, and that's not good for them either. But like I would love to have ducks. I would love to have a property where we could have ducks. Anyhow, <laughs> I want to know about uh, his ducks. I want zero birds, but that's okay. Um <laughs> Now, I did pull, because the biography is so short, I will say, though, that Alexis Hall on his website does have a very extensive FAQ section, and I would have loved to just have the entire FAQ section in this presentation. However, we did not have that much time, so we will link to the website so you can look at all of this for yourself. And you really should, because I also have looked at this and oh my God, it is so hilarious. Like I, before we read this book or any of his books, because I think we had also his other historical on our 2022 list called Something Fabulous. Mm -hmm. And um, I just like, obviously, like I hadn't read his work yet or because I don't read contemporaries really. And um just from reading his FAQs, I was like, oh my God, he is hilarious, witty, whip smart. I know I'm going to love his writing. <laughs> so. Absolutely. I mean, like there was a point in there where he talks about like the use of words and language and he's like, I just like to explore it because like the English language is so actually like varied and diverse. And so it's just like, I want to use good, like I want to use good language. And I'm like, ugh, sold. <laughs> <laughs> And also I was laughing out loud. So you're gonna yeah, have you're gonna have all sorts of a ride when you're reading his FAQs, but let's share this one that we have. Okay, so this is again most authors give a little bit more background. So this FAQ is question, where did you grow up? What's your relationship status? What's your favorite sexual position? <laughs> Answer. In general, I'm not comfortable answering these kinds of personal questions. Firstly, I'm a naturally private person person, and far too British to talk about my sex life, but mostly I'm just not very interesting. And I'm not saying that in order to be charmingly self-deprecating. I'm saying that because, well, if I had an interesting life, I wouldn't have all this time to write. Plus, as I kind of keep saying in this FAQ, I very much believe that an author's books should speak for themselves. He's so great. I know. I'm already <laughs> I mean, like, in love. <laughs> I just, it makes me smile just reading that. Um, you just – you can't help but feel charmed. Sorry. Yeah, there's another question in the FAQ that was like, can we be friends? And he's like, yeah, the answer to that is no. And I was like, damn it. That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also have a history fact this week. And I am definitely going to mispronounce this French name. So, listeners, I'm sorry about that. But um, I'm going to do my best. And I believe that – the person who we're going to speak about today has been brought up on the podcast before because when we were talking about this book, this book features a trans heroine. And so I just had this memory in my head of somebody talking about um, the person we're going to talk about today. And I think it was Kat Sebastian. I believe she just, or Olivia Waite, um, mm -hmm. in one of our interviews with them, brought it brought them up Um kind of just as like, there are records of people who have lived like this in the past. And yes. so I was like, it just was, it was somehow in my punch bowl. And I'm really glad we get to talk about them today. So today we're going to be talking about the Chevalier de Ion or Dion. What do we think, Kelsey? How, uh, how are we going to pronounce this today? Chevalier? Uh, do we Chevalier feel about that? sounds correct. <laughs> um, I would Dion. say Dion. We're going to say Dion. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. It's D apostrophe E-O-N. So Dion. Um, so a celebrated 18th century soldier, diplomat, and spy, the Chevalier Dion lived openly as a man and as a woman in France and England at different stages of life, drawing much public interest. The Chevalier was born on the 5th of October, 1728, to a minor aristocratic family in Burgundy. Bright and articulate, Dion worked as a spy and diplomat for King Louis the Fifteenth of France in Paris. After a stint as a captain in the French dragoons, they were sent to London as a diplomat. They embraced London life and continued to spy for the king before falling out with a superior. The Chevalier then sought political exile in London and published secret 
diplomatic documents in Letras. Uh, that's a city name that I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Memoirs et Negotiations, one of the most scandalous books of the time. The controversy caused by the book meant that Dion, whose name had formerly only been known in court and diplomatic circles, became something of a celebrity in London. The collection records no further Portrait Prince of Dion until summer of 1771, by which time the question of Chevalier's gender had become a matter of national interest. There had long been rumors in both Britain and France that the Chevalier was a woman, which developed into intrusive, pruent public interest. Having acquired almost celebrity status by 1771, London bookmakers had even begun to take bets on Dion's gender as the public debate raged on. From late 1777 onwards, the Chevalier began to permanently present as a woman. When the French Revolution began in 1781, Dion's annual French pension was suspended and money became scarce. Ever resourceful, the Chevalier began to perform fencing exhibitions in women's dress, astonishing audiences, and becoming a popular personality. Although finances remained tight, Dion had become a celebrity and prints were published, showing these famous fencing matches. The Chevalier was depicted in numerous satirical prints, many dating from the period of the gender scandal. In old age, the Chevalier lived with a widowed friend, Mrs. Coles, in modest circumstances. Despite the fame and notoriety that had accompanied this remarkable life, Dion died in poverty in May 1810 at the age of 81. Today, the Chevalier is recognized as a talented and tumultuous personality who was celebrated as both a man and a woman during a long and eventful life. So super interesting, and I really also recommend that you guys check out um, some of the portraiture of them online. It's fascinating. Yes. So this whole excerpt was taken from BritishMuseum.org, and they had a whole collection as well as a bunch of different pictures of the Chevalier. And then you can also look at Wikipedia, but, you know, I like to... Find articles not on Wikipedia sometimes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're, there are plenty of podcasts about Wikipedia articles. Uh, we try not to be one of them. <laughs> yes. It's a good place to start. Yes. So that's just a really interesting take because, you know, it seems like all of these are really modern issues. But the reality is people have been trying to live their best lives for as long as people have been living their lives. And you know, the matter of acceptance has really depended on the culture and, you know, the people of the times. And so it's a good thing to recognize that this isn't a new phenomenon and we can do better by supporting our fellow people. Absolutely. So our main tropes today, friends to lovers. Yes, that's pretty much the good one. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the main trope. I think that's really solid to say. Yes, and our main characters are Justinian de Vere, Duke of Gracewood, and Miss Viola Carroll. I am going to also read an excerpt from the beginning of the book real quick, which is the content guidance that is given by the author. Usually here we'll give trigger warnings, but I think that the author has written a couple of paragraphs perfectly. So I'm just going to read his words versus paraphrasing them in this case, because he's done a much better job than I can do. Just so you know what kind of, you know, content guidance uh, is... At available for this particular work. So, some characters who knew Viola before her transition refer to her dead name or use male pronouns when speaking about her in retrospect. But in keeping with the conventions of the period, this is only in the form of surname and title. Grace Wood has a disability to which he and others will occasionally refer using ableist language. There are some references to his suicidal ideation, as well as references to drug and alcohol abuse. So those are the content guidance warnings for this book, but I am ready to talk about the synopsis. So shall we get into it? We shall. Viola Carroll has been enjoying her life as companion to Lady Marley. That is until Louise, a.k.a. Lady Marley, gets a letter from Miranda de Vere and expresses great concern for the girl and that of her brother. The Duke of Gracewood was Viola's best friend in another life. Keeping him from her new life was necessary because their relationship could never be the same, and it was easier for her to have died at Waterloo. However, it turns out in the last two years, the Duke has not been doing well and blames himself for her passing. With trepidation... 
Viola and Louise set out for Morgancald, the Duke's Northumberland estate, to help Gracewood and his sister, Miranda. Viola is dismayed to see what has become of her former friend. He is a shell of the man she knew and has clearly been wallowing in opium and alcohol. Almost immediately, they connect, and the Duke starts to improve. He's detoxing from the opium and has stopped drinking. He is making an effort to visit his tenants, all the while bringing Viola along, as she has become like a lifeline to him. However, Grace had begins to develop real feelings for Viola. She makes him feel alive in a way he only ever felt with Marley. One day, they are on the beach, and Grace would ask if he can kiss Viola. She demurs, but they are standing on the edge of an embrace when suddenly Gracewood notices the distinct nature of Viola's freckles along her neck. He has finally put together Viola's secret. Quote, Two years. At last his eyes fastened onto hers. She had lived this scene a thousand times over in the darkest places of her mind, terrified of his disgust, his hatred, his contempt, his cruelty. Except now she was here, and there was only pain. Hers old and deep and aching, his new and whiplash raw, turned against her like the guns at Waterloo. You were my closest friend, the best part of my life, the best part of me. You were my joy, my hope, my faith in better things. All this time, I thought I'd left you, and it was you who left me. Tears were spilling down her cheeks, sticky with coal and powder. I didn't want to, Gracewood. Please believe that. But I couldn't go on. I couldn't go on as I used to. It was destroying me. Having to take in everything, Gracewood turns from Viola and asks to be left alone. Full of hurt for what was and wasn't said, Viola returns to the house and asks to leave immediately. Seeing the anguish she is feeling, Louise agrees it is time to go. But instead of going home to the country, they head to London, for Louise feels it is time for Viola to begin to live her life outside the safety of Mar the Marley Country Estate. A month goes by, and Gracewood is at Viola's door in London. He is here to ask for forgiveness, but also to look for a way forward. Quote, I miss my Marley. Gracewood's gaze did not waver. His eyes were pure water, shadowless. But if you think I came here for him, you are wrong. I am here for you. I am here for Viola Carroll. I know it's not the same, but you weren't the only one with secrets. I never let Marley know how fearful I was, how unsuited I felt for the rule cast upon me, how deeply I bore my father's scorn. But Viola Carroll saw and found good in me regardless. Tears rose hot and heavy to her eyes. Yes, yes, I did. And I always have. Viola, oh, Viola. His arms came round her then, and he drew her to him, where she wept against his chest and felt the softness of his tears as they landed in her hair. Please don't leave me again, he whispered. I think I could learn to live without you, but I have no wish to. She curled her fingers into his coat, her head still lowered and resolutely tucked away. I don't know how to do this. Do what? Any of it. I don't know what we are to each other, if how you felt on the beach before you recognized me was real. If it can still be real when you, when you, putting a hand beneath her chin, he turned her face to his. It was real, Viola. It is real. As real as you are. However, Viola does not believe that any relationship between them could work, but she does desire to help the Duke, Duke as he tries to move forward with his life. He does not believe she can be as effective in another household, so devises a way for them to live together that will not be looked upon with reproach by society. Viola moves to the Duke's household, quote, on loan from Lady Marley as Miranda's chaperone. The arrangement is overall a success. In an effort to connect with Miranda and offer friendship, Viola shows her all her cards. At first, Miranda's upset because Viola was instrumental in why she felt so alone over her year, over the years. Gracewood left her at home because he preferred Marley's company than that of his little sister. However, she believes that the offer of Viola's friendship is true, and Miranda does wish to have a life filled with friends and hopefully a better relationship with her brother. Thus, the London season starts for everyone. Viola and Gracewood do have a bond that grows stronger by the day, and they begin to share intimacies. They kiss at a card party thrown by Louise, and they share a waltz in the early morning hours after Miranda's debut ball. The friendship is becoming more, and it is not a one-sided thing. Gracewood meant it when he told Viola he sees only her. She is the one person he can share his burdens and failings with, something he finds difficult as his upbringing taught him that showing vulnerability was equal to weakness, and that was not to be tolerated. 
After weeks of growing friendship and sharing vulnerability, Gracewood wishes to be more intimate with Viola, and she is finally able to accept. Before, she could not, because she was worried about how it would reflect on her in society, but also because she did not want to start something if it meant she had to compromise. She would rather be a spinster than a mistress, but after a while, it seems cruel to deny herself pleasure, even if it is just in the short term. When we finally have an encounter, we also get a very satisfying I love you. Quote, I would say he shaped the words close to her mouth as if each one of them was its own kiss, a private prayer. I love you as a man loves a woman, but we both know that love is not bound by such narrow terms. So instead, let me simply tell you that I love you. I love you with the unfading flame of my friendship, with every drop of ardor in my blood. I love you with my soul, as some reserve their faith for absent gods. I love you as I believe in what is right and hope for what is good. I love you with everything I am and ever was. And if you only let me, with every day that comes and every self that I could ever be. She was silent. For a while, it seemed the only possible answer. Then she smiled, a smile that felt like no other smile she had ever smiled. Good. Now give me all the pleasure. (laughs) And after that encounter, things get a little wild. (laughs) Miranda is kidnapped from a masquerade ball, and they find that her kidnapping was orchestrated by the Duke of Amberglass, who is a strange character who seems to have no regard for anyone because he sees everything with apathy and boredom and therefore manipulates people just to see if it will relieve his boredom. When confronted, Amberglass refuses to tell them anything and also sets about trying to get a reaction from Gracewood by demeaning him. Viola cannot stand for this, and taking Gracewood's sword from his cane, duels Amberglass, finally breaking his nose, and on the way out, they get Miranda's location. So they ride out to Kent, where Miranda was taken in a suitor's harebrained scheme to force her into matrimony for her money. They have almost arrived when they see a horse and rider coming at them. Turns out it is Miranda who has saved herself, but is also so happy to see Gracewood trying to rescue her. They confront the Viscount, who is a bit of an idiot because he still wants to persist in the marriage of convenience. And Gracewood is like, ab so fucking lutely not. (laughs) So Miranda's reputation, um, but Gracewood does work it out. So Miranda's reputation is saved. And also a brother-sister relationship is repaired. But the whole scheme gives Gracewood an idea. He wakes Viola early the next morning to take her for for a walk. He tells her he is planning to buy the Viscount's estate to make it their home. Quote, I am richer and more powerful than any of them. If Viscount Sterling can abduct innocent debutantes and the Duke of Amberglass can start a fight in a brothel and have nobody say a word about it, then I'll be damned if I can't marry the woman I love. Still a little worried about the requirements of a duke and the need to produce an heir. Viola is minorly hesitant. Luckily, Gracewood is not hung up on having his own kids. Either Miranda's son or a far-off cousin can take the dukedom. He has found he doesn't care so much for those things as he does for Viola's love. He also tells her, though, that he believes that they could have a family in many other ways, and he would love to give Viola a family if that's what she wants. So she says yes, and they live happily ever after. And the epilogue is told by Jack, who is the oldest of Gracewood and Viola's children. He is questioning that he is not of the ducal blood, but Gracewood assures him that he is his son. We see a little bit of the family dynamic, and then we see a little bit of Viola being Viola. At the end, she jumps off a cliff with her son into the ocean, just as she did with Gracewood when they were young, inspiring life and freedom in another generation. Ah. A very kind of roaring final third of this book and a very satisfying ending. And I would love to talk more about it. So first, shall we adjourn to the parlor? We shall. So today we wanted to remind you guys that we have been guesting on a really fabulous podcast called Pod and Prejudice. 
And on that, we talked about the 2008 miniseries about Sense and Sensibility, and it ended up being three episodes because we had a lot to say. <laughs> we had way too Are much you... to say and way too much fawning over Dan Stevens's blue oh. eyes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. I mean, they were a consolation for not having Alan Rickman, so... <laughs> Um, but we really hope you guys check it out. You should check out Pod and Prejudice, and you should certainly check out the episodes of us on Pod and Prejudice as well. And you can find that everywhere that you get podcasts. And uh, once again, we are going to be pushing that Patreon Woo. because we are we now there and your support is everything to us. We are so close to reaching our first goal. And when we do reach that goal, there will be a raffle for everyone who is a patron on our Patreon. So here today in the parlor, I do want to quickly go over our tiers. We, our tiers start at $3 a month, and that's the ton. And with that, you do get some great rewards. Of course, our undying love and gratitude. You're going to get your name mentioned on our website and on the show, and a personalized thank you card sent in the mail, as well as a Regency Romance sticker, which says um, Regency Romance, happily ever after since 1811. Uh, very cute, designed or uh, imagined by Kelsey and realized by me. <laughs> so teamwork there. You're also going to get a tea and strumpets bookmark. Um, and if you have a little bit more to give per month, you can get your voucher to Almax. That's $5 a month. You get all the stuff I listed before, plus a tea and strumpets magnet, plus invita an invitation to quarterly Zoom discussions of a book that has been reviewed on the podcast. And this is June, so we're going to have a summer Zoom coming up soon. Kelsey is yeah. spearheading that one. On <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we're recording this kind of early. But um, Kelsey is spearheading our first one, so now is the time to sign up so that you can join in on that Zoom discussion. And finally, we have the aristocracy. If you uh, really would like to get a title in front of your name, for $10 a month, you get all the things before, and you also get the opportunity to pick a book to be reviewed on the podcast. And let us just say, <laughs> the first couple of books that have already been suggested Kelsey and I are super pumped about. So. Oh, yeah. We're super pumped. We're like, all right, cool. It looks like we don't have to do any work picking books out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you obviously our listeners have great taste. How am I? I'm, I'm so not surprised, but also I'm uh, really excited to read these books and talk about them on the podcast. And that will be coming out this fall because this summer um, – I'm having a baby, if y'all didn't know. <laughs> yeah, so, so we've already planned all that into the future. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. We've got some – so that I can have some time off. We've already got a lot of episodes up and in the bank. So, again, if you want to support us on Patreon, we would so appreciate it. And this podcast is and always will be free. But if you're in a position to support the show in a monetary fashion, you can head over to patreon.com slash T as in Tom and as in Nancy – Strumpets. All right, Kelsey. So this was a really interesting one. I was so excited to read this book. I was so excited that this book exists. Um, like, I'm just, I was, I mean, I still am. I'm thrilled that this book was written. Um, as I expected, this book was beautiful. Like it was so clever and mm -hmm. smart, really well done. But I have to admit up front to our listeners that this was not the book that I was in the mood to read. Same. Uh, I loved this book. I, I will say this. I love this book. Having read Me it, too. I'm really excited. I really want to read some more of Alexis Hall's books in general, yep. just because I'm really, I really loved his writing style. I thought it was beautiful. Um but yeah, it to me felt, and this is a very high compliment because obviously these are classics of the of not just the romance genre, but just classics of literature. But mm -hmm. starting this book, um, it felt like reading an old romance, like Austin Bronte old. Um, it's just, it's very well written. It's got beautiful descriptive language. Um, I feel very, um, like I'm getting to know the characters in a lot of detail. However, it took a little bit of time for me to get into it. 
as I was reading yeah. it. Like, and I will say this, like I was reading this while like horrifically dizzy and exhausted, like majority of the time. I just, I was having like crazy dizzy spells. So every time I picked this up, I was like, can I concentrate on the screen? Mm. Um, <laughs> and so like that made it difficult in its own right. Yeah. Um, however, like, so that was just a little bit more like, you know, however, once I kind of got into it, I will say like the last half of the book went by very quickly for me, but it was like, yeah. it was morning. I felt good. I had some tea. I didn't have any obligations. And I was like, I'm reading this. And then I was able to finish it really quickly. Um, so yeah, I was, I was trying to think of like what kind of made it a difficult read for me. I mean, I also admit I was really tired. I haven't had a lot of um, help this month with my kids. So I'm just a little frazzled and like, you know, <laughs> burnt out from that. Um, and I'm pretty pregnant. So I just like my energy levels are are low. Um, and I'm feeling stressed about like a lot of things that I have on my plate right now. <laughs> so I think when it comes to a book like this, that approaches some different, I would say, from the beginning themes through historical romance and a little bit heavier topics. I mean, I don't think that people falling in love is a heavier topic, but I have not read a trans person in a romance. And in the beginning of this book, you don't Gracewood doesn't know who Viola is, and Viola doesn't want to tell him because she, of a lot of reasons. She's not necessarily saying she's never going to tell him, but she knows that she can't just immediately introduce herself and tell him. That once mm -hmm. she sees him, she's like, there's no way that that would be good for either of us. Like, that is not going to go well. Mm -hmm. So – we have this secret, right, mm -hmm. at the beginning, which you and I also don't really like secrets, but I could not fault Viola for not telling no, him. No, I don't fault her at all. And I also believe like what I felt was really powerful about this, because honestly, starting this book the way it is written, because it's from Viola's perspective for the first good, like first few chapters, like we don't get into yeah. Gracewood's perspective until at least after Viola's first, like in like first meeting with him. And it's very much, um, it's very much written for her perspective and how she feels and who she is. And I will say this have, if you have not read the summary and you come in completely blind, her secret isn't really told to you either. Cause you know, cause it's not really a secret for her. Cause she's like, that's my past, but that's not really who I was. Like, this is who I am. Yeah. You know, and so like I felt that like, you know, reading through it, it wasn't like, oh, there was a big scene. You know, it kind of comes into bits where you kind of piece Viola's story together and her journey together mm -hmm. and where she's at. And yeah. so which I totally agree with, because I think that that could have been a big issue is it's like focusing on that as a main thing so much. And again, like having that be a well, main conflict and that wasn't the main conflict. Like, no, it absolutely wasn't. And I, I actually did not think that he was going to do that to us. I really did not think that Alexis Hall was going to make, um, you know, the main source of conflict be the fact that or she hadn't told Gracewood who she had been before. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I really trusted that he wasn't going to do that to us. Mm -hmm. But I just I think for me, where I was going with my point before was that I just didn't know exactly how it was going to play out mm -hmm. um, and what that was going to mean for their story. Um, and although I felt pretty confident that he was going to handle it all beautifully and interestingly, mm -hmm. um, I still was just like, but there is an unknown here for me, yes. right? Like, so so when I'm reading this romance novel, even though I know um, that he's going to do me well in yeah. this, I just, it was just hard because I was like, this is not just fluff. This is really serious, important, and I need to give this, like, I need to give this my energy and my consideration because it deserves my energy and consideration mm -hmm. and thoughtfulness. And unfortunately, I just didn't have very much to give. And in fact, at the end of the book, 
Um, Alexis Hall adds some questions for discussion. Did you read those? I did I read those. And the, so they the were first, great. <laughs> they're super great. I'm going to read a couple of them here. Um, but the first one is that he does say my intent for this book was for the fact that Viola is transgender not to be the main source of conflict. Was that intent successful? If not, why? If so, what is the main source of conflict? But regardless, I mean, whatever the main source of conflict you feel it is, I I just, I mean, I think it is wonderful that he is now also explicitly saying, like, that's not what I'm here for. And I think that's what um, Adriana Herrera was saying, too, with her book. She's like, I didn't want, you know, my character's race to be the source of conflict in the book. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to see how other people interpreted, uh, you know, moments and issues with that. And I thought, I mean, she said it more eloquently than I repeated it from weeks ago. Um so listen to our interview to hear her say that. Sorry. Um, but uh but yeah, I I I saw that coming. I and I loved I loved the way everything was handled. I felt like a student reading this book because I felt like I was here to learn something. And it was really fun to learn and really wonderful. Um, and I just like, I loved seeing them fall in love. I appreciated that he kind of, that the author, you know, he, he took us through their thoughts and their feelings. They had to be open and honest with each other. Once kind of the truth came out, he, he took us through also, you know, the bedroom scene and how it was going to work because Viola didn't know how things were going to work. She didn't know, like she didn't, she, she wasn't a hundred percent ready to be completely vulnerable because she didn't know how Grace would, would react to her. And, and his also too, was she amazing. was, and she was actually a virgin. <laughs> Yes. Like a true virgin, virgin too, because when she didn't know herself, she just never acted upon anything because she's like, nothing just seemed quite right to me. Like, yeah. you know, like it wasn't, but it was because she couldn't explore her sexuality because she didn't feel her, she didn't feel like herself in her own skin. It took finding herself to really understand her sexuality. And I thought the bedroom scene was beautiful. Agreed. I loved Completely agreed. every move. Like I thought it was also steamy. I thought yep. it was sexy. I thought it was mm -hmm. really beautiful. I thought it was like the perfect combination of vulnerable moments, steamy moments, playful moments. I thought it just had everything in it. Well, and I think also what was helpful was like knowing like there wasn't this question of if Grace would like – just was going to make this woman his mistress because like that, you know, a lot of the time that happens in our historical romances, right? Where the Duke is like, well, I will have this unsuitable woman as my mistress. Yeah, no. Well, he's, Viola is like, finally says like, okay, fine. I'll just be his mistress. But all along, Grace was like, I just think I will slowly, like, I will bide my time and, you know, be with her and allow her to gain confidence till she'll say yes to me. Like, yeah, he I don't think always Grace, wants like, to marry she's her. like, I'll be okay. Like, I'll just see the mistress and then walk away. And I just love it because I don't think Grace would like when Grace would recognize his feelings and recognize he was falling in love with her. He never thought of anything less than like the whole thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he, there wasn't a setting up of her own household or like having her apart from him or like marrying somebody else. He's like, no, you're, you're going to be my everything. I'm not sure what that's going to look like yet, but we're going to figure yeah. it out and we're going to have it happen. And I just like, the ending for me was so perfect where he's like, if these rich douchebags can be rich douchebags and have no repercussions, like why can't I marry the woman I love? Why can't I yeah. have everything I want? I'm yeah. a rich man. I'm a duke. Why am I not allowed to like use that for something? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty great. He had some great speech. I mean, there was just some great writing in this book in general. Um, but I think if I was going to, you know, my my critique or my my criticism of the book would be that kind of as we've said before, it starts off a little slow mm -hmm. and it feels a little long. However, on the flip side, I don't know if you can have the payoff or really um, talk about a love story like this or, you know, give this story the care and devotion it requires if you don't have all that set up first. No, I agree. And I think that, you know, even at the beginning, like that 
those vulnerable moments between Grace Red and Viola when she first comes there and he doesn't know who she is. I think those are so profound and so necessary for the development of that relationship. And, you know, I don't think you could have had everything that comes after that without it. And I think that having that slower beginning, I think really is more a hallmark, you know, of a tale like this because it was so heavy. And I mean, like also too, he was fighting with addiction. And one thing I loved about this is, you know, as someone who like has had, you know, has dealt with addiction with various family members, one thing that I think is very powerful is the fact that he never lets you forget that the Duke is struggling with that. Mm -hmm. There's a really, um, really interesting line where he's in London and he walks and he's like walking around and he just like, he's, he's like, and the country, it was easier. Cause like he could just have, like, you'd have to send for a bottle of laudanum. You'd have to send for the bottle of opium versus in London. It's like on every street corner, he can see the bottles like glistening out of the corner of his eye, you know, as he's walking down the street. And I'm like, yes, like that's a, you can feel he's not comfortable in London, not just because of society and like having to figure out how that works in his new, um, like with who he is now, but also just the fact that like he is going to struggle more by with that drug and alcohol addiction. Um, and you know, that plays a very central role in, you know, what brought them together. And I like that it wasn't like, she fixed him. He's beautiful. He's great. Yay. It's like, no, this is a lifelong mm-hmm. thing, but it's also, you know, their shared vulnerabilities and their abilities to, and their ability to be honest with each other is the foundation of their relationship. Absolutely. I mean, I think like, I, I think their relationship was so wonderful. And I think that, you know, the second half or the the last third of the book, I think maybe felt so much, uh, I don't know, more exciting to read. Well, first of all, more exciting things happen. It becomes more of like our fun, jaunty romance novel in some ways. But they're together. Mm -hmm. Like the moments that they're together on the, on the page are really like they, they really shine. And so I think, you know, we get a lot of them together, uh, at the end and that's, that's what made it like so wonderful to read. I think the, the build up to that was necessary, but somehow felt a little slow and a little long. So before we go into our hero and heroine opinions and rating, I do want to bring, uh, one more question from the uh, questions for discussion into our general discussion. And this is number six that he has, which is how obvious is it that the Duke of Amberglass is sequel bait? How okay with that were you? (laughs) (laughs) Now, the Duke of Amberglass is truly reprehensible. And in the one main scene you get of him, he is Awful, awful. But my answer is Sebastian St. Vincent. Like, <laughs> I will take it. Like, he he has very St. Vincent vibes or the Duke of, of Villiers or yeah. whatever um, from Eloisa James, how Villiers. I don't know how to pronounce it in French. I'm sorry, everybody. I didn't do my research. Um, But uh, yeah, no, I was... I was like, I would 100% read a book about this horrible man oh, being I was for reformed. sure already <laughs> looking for that to happen. And I was like, I thought, like, I mean, he was very much like sequel bait, but I'm also like, he could have been more sequel bait. I was waiting for, like, more things to happen. Like, yep. I was like, oh, this is for – because the moment they, like, brought him up, I was like, he's got something to play in here. Like, uh, I yeah. was like, he's important. He's important. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because he's very, very uh, outskirts for most of it. And then he has his big villain scene. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, and I love it. He's like, oh. I'm not going to monologue like a villain. Like, don't even. Yeah. He literally says it. He's like, I'm not going to give a villain monologue. So if you're waiting for that, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, he's so awful and great. I mean, he's great on the page, right? Yeah. No, I'm excited to see. I mean, like anyone who can write a successful redemption story is like top. So like I'm uh, willing to see this successful redemption. <laughs> Me too. All right. So let's talk about Gracewood and Viola. Um, I 
I have a hard time giving them both ratings. I'm going to be honest because I feel like, you know, a lot of the time we give ratings based on like, I mean, we give ratings based on all sorts of different subjective things, right? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's like how much we love them, like, and whatever love means to us on that day. And sometimes it's just like how good we think or how well we think they're written. Um, I don't know. I think they're both kind of like perfect. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't want them to be any different for this story. Um, that said, are they like my favorite hero and heroine I've ever read? Like, no, but I feel like there was nothing more I would have wanted from either of them. Agreed. I mean, I felt that there was a bit of like on both Well, more on Viola's, but there was a bit of like, will they, won't they vibes for me. And you know me, Uh I just like, I can only handle that for so long. It just gets repetitive after a while. But at the same time, too, I can't fault Viola for that because I think she had very valid concerns and fears. And she had like just discovered, you know, who she was and was very like wanted to protect that in a lot of ways. And I felt that a lot of her wishy-washiness, not really that she was wishy-washy, but a lot of this will they, won't they, it stemmed from a place of real vulnerability. And like, you know, we just got more internal dialogue than I think, you know, we're used to getting. But I thought it was necessary. And I can't really fault her for that. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, the first half of the book, the author does such an incredible job with talking with, with, with kind of going through Viola's thought process and her, her her thought process of just who she is, where she came from, how hard it was to get there, and, you know, how hard of a position she was in at that time. The, the will they, will she, won't she tell Gracewood even. Like, and, yeah. and I, every time that she would waver in her head, I was like, I'm right there with you, girl. I don't, yeah. I don't know. No, I, I, I agree. And then and there's the problem of like, oh, I should have told him earlier, but now that I haven't told him, like, is it going to be worse to tell him now? Like, you know, I fully understand that. Um, and so here's a quote, here's a quote from one of those moments. And she says, quote, or, and she's thinking, quote, so who did that make her? Someone who took affection, trust, and loyalty and replayed them in hurt and loss and guilt. She should never have come here. She should never have listened to Louise because now she was trapped, trapped between the lie her past had forced her to live and the lie that had made her future possible. Except it wasn't a lie. Gracewood was right to mourn her. She had died two years ago on a battlefield in France. She was Viola Carroll. She had always been Viola Carroll. And some part of her had always known it. There was only one thing she hadn't known. One truth that locked in pursuit of her own she hadn't grasped. It was simply this, that love, that her love for Gracewood and his love for his friend had not died with her. I mean, to me there, it's like, it's just such a kind of perfect, perfect explanation. Mm -hmm. There really, there's no, there's no right answer, you know, in, in this situation. And it just, that time had to be the answer. So I'm going to, I'm going to opt out of rating them because I like, don't feel like it's fair. I don't feel like it's fair to rate them. I think that they were excellent characters. I think we can, I think we can, yeah, hold off on that and just write the book as a whole. I think that's totally fine. I can say like, we've spoken a lot about Viola, but like Gracewood for his point, you know, was a man who was basically ruled you know, by his father with an iron fist and then like, you know, lives with the guilt of the fact that like his friend, his best friend died in Waterloo and he was the one who went to Waterloo and he was the one who signed up for the army to go fight, you know, because he was finally outside his father's rule and just like was like, I need to figure out how to be the Duke. What better way to do that than go to battle? And then Mm. living with the repercussions and living with his ghosts and learning how to do that. Because, like, yes, there was the big one of Viola, but there was a bunch of other ghosts for him, too. There was other men that he was, you know, leading that died there. And he has to suffer their loss just as much as just as much as like his best friends. And then, you know, coming to terms with that and then also 
finding the ability to love and be vulnerable. And it was such a magical moment, I think, for him, because I think once he kind of embraced that vulnerability with Viola, he was more willing to sh- like go to that place, which I think made him very powerful in a lot of ways. You know, I think that a lot of times, you know, when we read our hero, our heroes have their vulnerable moments. Sometimes they don't feel like, super vulnerable but I feel like every little like snippet we got of like how the Duke was feeling was like a personal like struggle for him to share Mm -hmm. it and Mm -hmm. I really felt that and then you could feel like towards the end of the book like you know he just became so much more comfortable and sharing that with Viola and then also and and, well exactly and I was like and by the end of it with Miranda too but that was such a struggle because he's like I don't know how to be a brother I know how to just command like I know how to be a Duke not a brother Well, what I also thought was great about him is like every time that somebody uh, important to him said something logical, he would concede, Mm -hmm. you know? So I'm going to read a quote now about him. Um, So it's a little bit long, but I'll try to get through it. Um, So uh, unfortunately, it was then that she chose to cross to the side of the desk in order to retrieve his cane. And just like that, he felt entirely the wrong kind of fool again. I would prefer you didn't treat me as an invalid, Miss Carroll. He had expected to discomfort her. Most people were discomforted when they noticed or remembered his injury or when circumstance drew attention to it. And yet more so when he rejected the pity, he knew it had become his duty to accept graciously. Miss Carroll, though, simply resettled his cane within easy reach and asked, Why were the 95th sent to hold the sand quarry? Why were the abrupt change of subject and in such a specific direction had caught him rather off guard? Why were what? Why were the 95th sent to hold the sand quarry? Well, because we were in position and best suited to do it. I see. And did that reflect poorly upon the rest of the army? At this point, he wasn't sure how successfully he was concealing his bewilderment. Of course not. I picked up your cane for you, she told him, because I was in position and best suited to do it. He hardly knew if he wanted to concede her point or not, how to separate his pride from his shame, from his fear, from the need for her to think well of him. That, that is not how other people would see it. Then that is their error. Her gaze held his unflinching. It need not be ours. And I just kind of like love that. That I think that's a turning point for him, right? Mm-hmm. Where she just says like, I did it because I was in best position, you know, yeah. suit, best suited to do it. And he does concede and they they continue to talk about it. They actually like start to talk about his um, his injury and his issues, and it's from there that he he opens up and concedes. and And then as things go on, he also is just like, "Yeah, you're right." <laughs> like, yeah, you know, it's it's not this kind of like big revelation to him. It's just, you know what? I have grown from this moment, and excellent. Yes. Now, but now we're going to move on to our favorite quote. So, like, you've shared some quotes. So, Mm -hmm. but do you have a favorite? I mean, like I did put a lot of quotes in there because I really wanted to get, I really wanted to share the like depth of the writing because I thought it was just so great. And so like in a lot of things, it's like I could write a summary, but I could also just like share the quote, which I think just summed up these really um, vital moments. Yeah, it's really it's really hard to pick a favorite because there's so many great little ones. Um, So I'm going to share like, one, um, I'm going to share like a couple little guys then just of like, I think, brilliant writing. First mm-hmm. of all, um, there's a line that is very sense and sensibility. So if you um, haven't listened to our Pot and Prejudice, you should do you should do that, uh, our Pot and Prejudice appearances. But mm-hmm. it's just a quick thing. And uh, someone saying, but I swear by any God who gives a damn, I will endeavor to deserve. And uh, there's that line from Sense and Sensibility, like, uh, Mm-hmm. I hope he endeavors to deserve her. And that just made me, <laughs> that made me happy. Um, that is actually a perfect segue for okay. the quote that I, one of, like a quote, I have more that like I can also uh-huh. share, but one of them that I put in that I just, I loved just as a line was, I'm not sure I is from Viola and it says, I'm not sure I like the idea of being deserved, but I have only ever seen your strength, Gracewood. I watched for years as you fought to be the man you knew you should be. And that gave me courage when it was time for me to fight for myself. Nice. I... 
I have another one that I just really liked the um, content uh, of it. And it was Viola saying this as well. Um, And she says, why is it virtue in women to preserve what it is virtue in men to pursue? And why do we even call it virtue? Surely that is a component of the spirit, not the body. Um, And I just really love that because it's like such a historical romance, like trope, the virtue and like the woman's virtue and, and, you know, the idea of, of virtue actually being, you know, something of the spirit, not of the body, right? Because in men, it's considered of the spirit Mm -hmm. and in women, then it's like considered of the body, but why isn't it considered of the woman's spirit, you know? So I, I really, um, no, I thought that was a bit of like a thought provoking moment. And, Mm -hmm. um, I think to finish up, I'm going to share an interaction with little, little Bartholomew, Viola's mm-hmm. nephew, because he's great. And her moments with him were just so fascinating. They were just so fun and clever. And mm-hmm. so here it is. Were I a pirate, little Bartholomew observed, I should make all of my precious stones look like ordinary stones. That way, nobody would steal them from me. And I should be the richest pirate on the seven seas. But if all of your precious stones look like ordinary stone, Viola had the sneaking suspicion she was walking into another of little Bartholomew's traps. Nobody would buy them from you, so your wealth would bring you nothing. Little Bartholomew shrugged, but I would know that I had it. And I think that if I knew that I shouldn't much care what other people said. Ah, Bartholomew. I mean, he's like a little font of wisdom, that little dude. (laughs) Well, but you know what? The way that his parents both talk to him is fabulous. Like yeah. it is it is great parenting. Um I they're, they're very reasonable, but they uh, anyhow, I I loved Bartholomew, um her nephew and yeah, it was it was pretty great. Um so I do actually have one more quote, but I feel like it would go really well with our feminist recap. So I'm going to save it for that. Perfect. Um we had, I already mentioned cuz now we're talking about our steaminess and our encounter counter. Um, There was really only one full encounter. The other one was interrupted very suddenly. I wasn't sure. I couldn't remember. So I'm glad you you remembered. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, um, yeah, it was interrupted. And, but our one full encounter was very steamy. Personally, Uh, I thought, like, I was getting a little hot and bothered. I thought it was beautiful. I was like, it hit all the knots. I was like, consent open sexuality, exploration, like making you feel pretty, a little playful, a little vulnerability. I was like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you said it perfectly. Like it was just real, like, because again, like I have not read a transgender romance. So I didn't know what the bedroom scene was going to look like, especially in like a historical where there maybe where there isn't the option of gender reassignment surgery, you know, like, so I just, I was so interested to see how the characters would interact with each other, like, and the, the conversation between them, because that's what had to happen to make it sexy, you mm-hmm. know, was to, that they were both like open, honest, vulnerable. And it was so beautiful. Like it was just so beautiful. And, you know, hopefully my, my thoughts and words here, um, don't make me seem anything other than naive about this kind of relationship, but yeah, like I loved it. It was steamy. Mm -hmm. And like, I was so happy when they got together. I was just like, yeah, finally. Yeah. No, uh, finally, like, they had all these really cute, tender moments. And I was like, okay, I get it. But, like, let's get some heat in here. <laughs> <laughs> and they sure did heat it up. Mm-hmm. So our feminist recap, as we call it, um, obviously, this is a super intersectional feminist book. Um, there are so many wonderful things about the women in this book. This, The women in this book are just on fire. They really are. Like from Louise, who is super outspoken and cannot be told no by anyone, but also is like very much like, love my husband, love my family, you know, like mm-hmm. she she's amazing. And then her friend, Lady Lillamere. Yeah. Stevie uh, is her. Stevie. Yeah. They call her Stevie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's a really fascinating character. She, um, you know, she's basically has all of her money and she was like, I'm just not going to care 
you know, I'm going to live my life the way I choose to live it. And she chooses to live it. Um, obviously not like openly gay because still, you know, Victorian, Victorian times. However, like she does live it very bohemian. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and it's not unheard of, you know, like people know yeah. the rumors about her, but like, you know, she keeps it in, it's closed for society, people, but her people, good friends know about it. Like, no, society knows society about it. Society knows That's about it, but yeah. they, they basically are like, well, she has they so much money, anyway. we have to accept it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she's great. And she was so funny and interesting and wonderful. And Miranda's also a little Oh, and her a little and bit... reaction to Miranda. Like, Miranda's oh, just trying so to – like, Miranda's 17. And there's a beautiful scene where she's, like, basically trying to figure out her own sexuality. Like, she's like, I don't know. Like, I kissed a dude and it didn't really do much for me, but, like – Maybe I should kiss a woman. Maybe that'll change it, you know? And then Viola says it perfectly, which is like, maybe you should kiss someone you actually like. Yeah. And see, you know, like it's not, it's not about if they're man or woman. It's like, maybe instead of trying to like shoot, it's like, maybe you should like the person before you kiss them. Yeah, that, that might help. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, no, so they, they, Anyhow, I loved all the relationships in this book. I think in general, like all of the people were building each other up. Um, you know, Miranda didn't have to be saved by a, a male hero at the end of the day. <laughs> she broke that. a vase over her captor's head. It was amazing. Like, and was riding off already. But then they went, she's like, wait, I have to go back to his house. No, she's like, she tells her brother, she's like, I think I murdered him. And he's like, yeah. then we should go find out. She's like, what do you mean? I have to go back. He's like, and she's like, and she's like, and I also stole his horse. And he's like, so maybe we should go back. She's like, I'm pretty <laughs> sure I didn't murder him. I don't know why I have to go back. He's like, well, then maybe we could just cross horse thief off the things that we are. <laughs> and she's like, I guess, I guess you're correct. <laughs> yeah, it was so great. So I, so I liked that he didn't have to like, you know, save her. Right. Mm -hmm. But he was able to go in and, and, you know, use his, his white man, rich white man power to, to Help her. make it so that her life wasn't ruined. Yes. Right. Which is fabulous. But I also just love to, like, it was so great because she was able to save herself, but at the same time to, you know, for her to see her brother coming after her in the middle of the night, AKA early or early morning, whatever time it was, I couldn't really quite figure all that timing out, but Seeing her yeah. brother like coming after her, she was like, he does love me. He does care about me. <laughs> yeah. So one of the themes that is so present in historical romance is women who are trying to kind of break out of the status quo and have more rights or fight for their rights, right? Mm -hmm. Or be feminist. Yeah. Um, so it is quite the paradox, right, that here is a man who has all this power. I, I'm talking very base level here, who is going to live a life as a woman in this society that makes life harder for women, mm -hmm. right? So, but the author does address this. And so that's where the quote that oh, I yes, wanted to bring in uh, comes in. So, quote, and wasn't that strange and uncomfortable, yearning to be part of something that other women yearned to be free of? How many of those debutantes would have given all their silks and their pearls and their flowers to live instead the life that Viola had, one of travel and adventure and friendship? You know, so like, I think that that was interesting. So that wasn't just like, commenting on the fact that she had once been a man, but that was commenting also on the fact that she was a spinster now, like, you yeah. know, had a little bit of freedom and power. But I think it is just an interesting, you know, an interesting comment. And I appreciate the that the author at least put it in there, right? That like, yeah, the, the women of this time didn't have power. And so, you know, obviously, like, Viola didn't... Viola's need to be herself yeah, usurped any benefit of power or freedom because yeah. again like having the power and the freedom was you know it was nice but it never allowed her to live truly as herself and she felt that living yep. as her true self was more important than any sort of power yeah or freedom and but totally she's like I can like for me my freedom is not does not come with a title but my freedom comes with living as my true authentic self Absolutely. And I think like 
you know, that that is 100% the takeaway that I had. But I do think it's just, I mean, I don't have much more than just the comment on it, which is that it is an interesting kind of flip, right, mm-hmm. of of something that we, we see as a theme in historical romance. Um, yeah. But I thought everything was just so beautifully done. I agree. Are we ready to rate this book as a whole? So ready. I mean, I- I'm wavering because my personal enjoyment of this book, I like I said, I had a struggle in the beginning because it just wasn't it wasn't that easy to like get into, but like the last third of the book, I just I really enjoyed. So like I think my personal enjoyment of this book is an eight point five. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think this book is is better than that. Actually, I think it's like a nine nine point five. I mean, I can't give it a perfect ten just because I I do think the beginning was a little was a little slow to develop, and and so it's not a perfect ten to me. But but my personal enjoyment probably was eight point five. I'm sorry. It's okay. I want it to be higher. I would agree with that though. Like that's I feel like my personal opinion. I think as a book as a whole is really good. And you know, I would rate it like a nine, nine point five, like in total. Again, I do agree with you. Like it's not a perfect 10 for me, but like at the same point too, like there's really nothing I would change about it. Like mm-hmm. and I think that my personal enjoyment again is maybe closer to that 8.5 mark. However, I will say this too. I am also a person who has never been able to get through a Jane Austen novel. And so many people would though so many people would rate those like tens out of tens. You know? Yeah. And like, and so it's like, I can't say that this book isn't like that is not that because it has it checks all the boxes, you know, everything else about that is then subjective to the person. And just because I like going in there and being like immediately like bing bing bang and like drawn into the page you know like that's a little bit different but that's that's a personal me thing versus anything else i don't think that there's any faults in this book in any way shape or form yeah i couldn't find places where i was like yeah that whole scene could have gone because sometimes like the scenes with bartholomew i was like uh this kid again but they were also perfect i know they were were perfect and they had meaning and they moved the story exactly and i was just like damn it (laughs) there really was nothing superfluous in this book there were no like parts or scenes that were superfluous that were superfluous everything really was grounded in meeting kept the story going along like it really you know pointed to everything else and i think that everything was necessary so listeners we hope you read this book because i think we talked about it a lot if you haven't read it yet i just really think like the journey of the characters and and seeing what they both seeing the growth that they both go through is like it's just really beautifully done and i hope everyone reads it yes i agree with that wholeheartedly on a lighter note what are we reading next time (laughs) so next time we are going back to the much requested bridgerton second epilogues and our next one is Francesca's, ah. which is When He Was Wicked, the second epilogue from the Bridgerton's Happily Ever After. Wonderful. And there's news in the Bridgerton world about a Francesca recast. However, we're not going to talk about that here because we have already talked about it on our Patreon. So we if have. you sign up for that, then you can get access to it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And today we'd like to thank our wonderful patrons who have pledged their support to us on Patreon. That's patrons like Jen Powell, Aaron Haas, Jason Melenda, Ashley, Jessica Olwell, Camille, Jesse Wallace, Marie C. Tremblay, Kristen Avila, Carolyn Constantino, and Sylvia Georgieva. Thank you all so much. Um, You are our current patrons, and we can't believe there's so many of you. (laughs) And if you'd like to join them, you can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash T as in Tom and as in Nancy Strumpets. So listeners, thank you so much for listening today and every time that you do. Happy Pride Month, and join us next time as we read Francesca Bridgerton's second Happily ever after. And may all your ever afters end happily. Happily.